Mycoplasma bovis is not a foreign animal disease. We absolutely have this one in Canada, and it really has worldwide distribution. Um, it's associated with a variety of clinical syndromes, um, including arthritis, pneumonia. It causes a caseonecrotic pneumonia, which is oftentimes polymicrobial, genital infections and abortion, as well as mastitis. Once Mycoplasma bovis is inside the host, it disseminates hematogenously, and so infection of more than one body site is frequently seen. Mycoplasma bovis is maintained in the herd by carriers. Um, these can be animals that have subclinical disease. Maybe they've recovered. Um, the organism can be identified in both the colostrum and semen, so it persists in colonized animals for a long period of time. Also interesting to know that M. bovis infections can be intracellular, so we require drugs which readily pass uh, plasma membranes and can get those high intracellular concentrations. We have no vaccines available for mycoplasma bovis, and so really what we need to do is just isolate affected animals, if at all possible. Treatment relies on antimicrobials, um, and anecdotally, this works much better in acute disease. So those which are chronically affected may not respond well, even to appropriate antimicrobials. In this image on the right, you can see a multifocal to coalescing necrosuppurative bronchointerstitial pneumonia caused by mycoplasma bovis. And these caseating lesions that you can see all throughout the lung are really common and, and characteristic of polymicrobial infections. I said Mycoplasma bovis has a worldwide distribution, and it's thought that New Zealand was actually probably the last country in the world to become infected with it. The economic costs associated with this uh, pathogen led the government to initiate an eradication program in 2017, and they've been moving forward with that since that time. Um, I pulled these screenshots just from the government's website, um, but you can see the total number of uh, properties that they've been able to depopulate and then subsequently reimburse the farmers for the loss of their animals. If you're interested, I would encourage you to check out their website. There's a lot of good information there about uh, the Mycoplasma bovis eradication program. And it's sort of an interesting perspective on how we might go about trying to eradicate a fairly tenacious disease. Mycoplasma galliseptacum is one of the most pathogenic mycoplasma species in birds, and turkeys tend to be more severely affected than chickens. In turkeys, what we see is infectious sinusitis, so mucopirulent sinusitis and air sacculitis. Oftentimes, affected birds will have thick strands of ten tenacious mucus coming out of their nose. In broilers, we'll have chronic respiratory tract infections. And in layers, so layer chickens, um, the infections are usually subclinical, but what you'll see is a reduction in the number of eggs that are being produced. Mycoplasma galliseptacum also plays a role in polymicrobial infections, so it plays with other organisms, and it's transmitted between animals both vertically within the eggs and horizontally via aerosols. Control of these infections is about good biosecurity, so preventing introduction into the herd if at all possible, and then we treat it with tetracyclines and macrolide type drugs. In these pictures here, you can see turkeys with sinusitis. Um, the infraorbital sinus is the most commonly affected anatomical location in these guys. And you can see here just under the eye, sort of between the eye and the beak, um, this large uh, swollen lesion. So this is that common clinical manifestation that you'll see along with uh, tenacious mucus coming out of their nostrils. In pigs, mycoplasma hyopneumonia causes enzootic pneumonia. Um, this is typically a chronic and mild disease. It's endemic pneumonia. You'll see a persistent dry cough and perhaps reduced production. So the feed conversion rate goes down. Flare-ups of more active disease are seen with poor management, so poor ventilation. Um, it's a disease that does transmit by aerosol, um, potentially even over quite long distances, so up to 1.5 kilometers in cold, wet conditions. It's common to see uh, lung lesions uh, associated with mycoplasma hyopneumoniae at slaughter. So we know these infections are probably much more common than the frequency of overt clinical disease would suggest. We can control mycoplasma hyopneumoniae with uh, custom bacterins. These have been applied. 
Um, but really, it's all about preventing mixing. So all in, all out management and trying to source replacement stock from specific pathogen free herds. Treatment, just like in our poultry species, relies on the macrolides and tetracyclines. In this image on the right, you can see focally extensive bronchopneumonia. So these two sections of the lung lobe here just sort of has this meaty, congested, uh, perhaps atelectatic appearance. In cats, uh, we see a variety of mycoplasma species possibly involved in disease, including mycoplasma felis. Um, it is a member of the upper respiratory microbiota, and we find it in both healthy cats and in association with disease. Oftentimes when we see clinical infections, they are polymicrobial. In these infections, um, it's unclear whether mycoplasma felis is a primary pathogen or kind of a secondary invader. It's also been associated with conjunctivitis, um, serous discharge from the eyes, which can then become mucoid. Lower respiratory disease is also recognized. Um, if you do find mycoplasma felis from a, a culture, like a transtracheal wash, it's probably clinically significant and you should believe it. Um, in kittens, it is well recognized as a cause of pneumonia. Just like in our pigs and chickens, um, we treat these infections with tetracyclines, macrolides, and the fluoroquinolones are also an option. I would encourage any of you who are interested in working in feline practice to take a look at the uh, feline med surge guidelines. So this was a great paper um, that has some really good information on uh, identifying and managing these diseases. Moving on to our hematrophic mycoplasmas, with starting with mycoplasma hemophilus, um, there was initially a lot of taxonomic confusion as to what exactly these organisms were. So they used to be called hemobartonella. We even thought that they may be within the rickettsiales order. These organisms parasitize erythrocytes. And we see several species in cats, although mycoplasma hemophilus is the most common. So in this image on the right, you can see a blood smear um, from a cat. And these basophilic structures on the erythrocytes are the mycoplasma organisms. The hallmark of these infections is anemia. Immune-mediated hemolytic anemia in cats is frequently precipitated by some primary cause, and mycoplasma hemophilus is a great reason for a cat to have IMHA. These infections are characterized by lethargy, weakness, depression. Um, we can see tachypnea and dyspnea. We can also see hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. The incubation period of these infections is two to 30 days following exposure. In this image here, you can see uh, organs from a cat which had findings that were cytologically consistent with mycoplasma hemophilus, so they could see the organisms on peripheral smear, although it wasn't definitively identified by PCR. But what I'd like you to appreciate is that we have a very enlarged spleen. So this is something that happens with hemolytic anemia, we also have uh, hepatomegaly, and from this abdominal fat, I think you can appreciate that this cat was also icteric. This organism is transmitted through aggressive interactions. Um, biting is thought to be the most important mechanism of transmission. We do also see vertical transmission from clinically affected queens to their kittens. And experimentally, mycoplasma hemophilus has been shown to be transmitted by fleas, although the real-world role of this in, in the epidemiology of the pathogen really remains undetermined. We control these infections by keeping cats inside. This is very, very important, as it prevents fighting amongst outdoor animals. And then these infections can be treated with the tetracyclines or fluoroquinolones. There's a wide variety of other hemotrophic mycoplasmas. Um, and the reclassification is not yet complete. So watch out for names like epirythrozoan and hemobartonella as you're reading the literature or some older textbooks. And don't forget about infectious differential diagnoses in cases of anemia. It's been recognized in many, many species. So here we've got one in a ferret. We've got mycoplasma hemolama in a llama, uh, hemocanus, suis, waonii, ovis, etc. The mycoplasmas are very susceptible to adverse environments. So if you're working with a non-hematrophic mycoplasma, so the ones that we actually can culture, uh, transport media is a must. Talk to the lab about mycoplasma broths and how they prefer to receive samples. In cases of respiratory infections, respiratory fluids, 
collected by transtracheal wash or bronchoalveolar lavage can be really useful. Synovial fluid, so think about those cows with mycoplasma bovis arthritis. And tissues collected at necropsy, so lung, lung tissues primarily. In cases where we have mycoplasma mastitis, when milk is collected, it can be really useful to add ampicillin. This will inhibit the growth of other organisms, but like I said, mycoplasma don't have cell walls, and so ampicillin will have no impact on them. But don't forget to send a sample without ampicillin as well to allow the culture of kind of the normal organisms, our staphs, our streps, and our gram-negatives. And then blood, particularly in cases of hemotrophic mycoplasmas. When your sample is submitted, you need to make sure to request mycoplasma culture. It requires different media than other organisms, and so the lab needs to know that this is what they're looking for. Oftentimes, as we saw, the colonies have a fried egg-like appearance, and some species require some really specialized media. So mycoplasma mycoides, for instance, although hopefully this is an organism that you won't ever encounter. Serology is also widely done, um, depending on the species. Um, this can be either through an ELISA, hemagglutination inhibition, or complement fixation. We have PCR assays, um, both real-time and conventional, single-plex, multiplex. There's a wide variety of possibilities. I would encourage you to check with your favorite diagnostic lab to see what they have on offer. And then finally, we have fluorescent antibody tests to identify the organisms in situ to actually associate the bug with the lesion. For our hematopic mycoplasmas, cytology can be a really useful test. So again, we're looking for those basophilic structures on erythrocytes, like you can see here. Um, in cats, it's been shown that this is a very, very specific finding. So if you find these basophilic structures, 84% of the time, it's going to be one of our hematopic mycoplasmas, but it has a low sensitivity. So you're only going to detect 11% of true positives. So it can be useful for ruling it in in the clinic, but you aren't going to rule out a diagnosis of mycoplasma hemophilus uh, cytologically. There are also PCR assays for hematopic mycoplasmas. Generally speaking, mycoplasma are quite host-specific, and so zoonotic transmission or transmission between species is quite rare even amongst people with immunosuppression. So from a zoonotic perspective, these are not of great concern. Treatment of these infections is essentially always empirical. We have no standardized methods for conducting or interpreting susceptibility tests on uh, veterinary mycoplasma. Um, we do have some methods for human mycoplasma, but unfortunately these methods cannot be applied to the species relevant to veterinary medicine. The organisms are just quite different. And then, of course, in cases of our hematrophic species, we can't grow them on agar plates, so it's impossible to do the testing. We do, however, know that they are intrinsically beta-lactam resistant because they lack that peptidoglycan-based cell wall, and therapy oftentimes relies on the tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones. Have a couple of new terms for today, and of course, some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.